Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking about the Gigabyte power supply testing a little bit more. We just want to make sure that Gigabyte doesn't try and change the story as it becomes aware of our testing. We'll also be talking about AMD's new GPU, but not the 6600 XT, no. Instead, we'll be talking about the dual GPU card that AMD has pushed out alongside uh, Apple for that one. Asus and Noctua have filed plans for collaborating on something. We'll talk about that as well. It's an ECC filing and we'll be going over uh, AMD and Valve working together to optimize the Steam Deck for surprisingly, maybe not Linux. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly. Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut and Cryonaut thermal paste are high performing thermal interfaces for use on CPUs and GPUs. You can bring an old card back to peak performance by repasting it and doing preventative maintenance, and Thermal Grizzly's Hydronaut is ideal for water cooling and air cooling for new and old cards alike. Cryonaut paste is one of the top performing pastes for extreme overclocking with CPUs and GPUs, and has been used in several world record scoring machines. Learn more at the link in the description below. All right, so first up, we're really happy with how the Gigabyte power supply piece went over. That, just some really quick behind the scenes stuff, that was months in the making, as you know if you watched it. But a lot of it was just, we were really obsessing over the small details on this one and trying to make sure we got everything right, enough to nail Gigabyte down with the evidence that we were collecting from the power supplies. So it was a lot of work. It was a lot of communicating with experts in power supplies uh, in the industry to make sure we understood our findings correctly. That's a big part of data collection is you can collect all the data you want, but if you don't really understand what you collected, you could potentially cause more harm than good. So we're really careful about that, and that's why it took so long to work on. But we're happy with the, the performance overall. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out. Uh, if nothing else, check out the first 15 seconds. We'll, we'll put one teaser clip in here for you now. Some of those clips we've been showing in the teasers, are they're just really cool to see the how the fire lights up in the power supply. It's kind of crazy how fast it all happens. Uh, so a couple things here. We are, uh, we became aware that Gigabyte internally, HQ, might be sort of communicating with its other branches that this is an old issue. Uh, it sounds like Gigabyte HQ might be taking an angle of saying, this is a year old, we're not gonna talk about it or, or it's resolved or whatever. So to be clear, just in case Gigabyte does try to go that route, we're gonna, we're gonna head them off right now and just make sure everyone's on the same page. Most of the power, actually all of the power supplies we bought, we bought this year. Nothing is from last year. And several of them were from around May. Uh, I think our newest ones we purchased were in about May. And we had power supplies fail from that we purchased or acquired between February and May of this year. Uh, and we had power supplies we acquired from our viewers. And thank you very much to those of you who helped us get those from last year. So we had power supplies across a, a wide range of months from about maybe November, December, somewhere in there till about May. So I just want to make sure that Gigabyte's not going to try and change the story to make it sound like we dug up a bunch of old power supplies. Uh, although that would still be very bad, by the way. It, the, the, an excuse of, oh, our power supplies did explode, but they haven't done it for a few months. So this is a non-issue. That would still be bad, just to be clear, but just want to make sure that's not how the, the story is tweaked. You, you always, you learn a lot about a company when they respond to these types of things. And uh, we'll see what Gigabyte's response is. We haven't seen how they're going to take it yet. But we were in communication with them for a while before publishing, so they knew what was happening. And if you missed it, following up that Gigabyte piece, it was extremely expensive for us to do, mostly because of the staff time. So obviously, the team doesn't work for free. Uh, and working for this long on something, it, it was basically a lost leader. But uh, if you'd like to help support that type of work or our pre-built reviews, anything like that, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net. Right now, we have a code that is called send help. So you can type in send help in the discount section when you check out. It'll give you 10% off of any items on the store. And that is our thanks for those of you who have supported us in being able to get to the stage where we can buy 10 power supplies. I wasn't able to do this years ago. It's only possible because of the community support and the amount of uh, interest that there is now in this stuff. So thank you. And uh, the wireframe mouse mats have been selling crazy fast. We still have a lot of them. We should be good there. But if you want one, jump in and grab one. They're on the store. They've been out 
uh, and they sell through very quickly every time. But we've been getting better with holding on to inventory for a little while. So they're on the store. Uh, we also have the mod mats. The Volt mod mats are available on back order. Those are coming back in in September. Uh, th we're thinking about mid to late September right now, and we'll ship those out. So if you want to guarantee you get one, you can back order it on the store, and that'll make sure you get one in the next round so you're not waiting for uh, the round after that. Next up, we want some quick feedback in the comments. So you likely know that we've been doing system integrator or OEM pre-built gaming PC reviews for a while now, and we're moving on to the next set. We have a review of a SkyTech system that's going up within the next days. It's done. Uh, and we're looking to buy the next group of them. So what we would love to know from you all is what should we buy next? Which brands or OEMs are you most interested in seeing us review next? We would prefer to buy sort of one system from each major SI or OEM brand rather than doubling up and buying multiple from the same just so we can test everybody's competence first before we double back and go see how they're doing now. So. Post a comment below, let us know which brands uh, you are interested in seeing reviews for. We're thinking the $1,000 range and the $2,000 range. If there's enough interest for a different price range, then obviously we'll, we'll add that as well at some point. Uh, and if you see a comment for the brand that you're going to suggest, please upvote the other person's comment as well. That way it'll help us get visibility to what's the most interesting. Well, it's just a bunch of comments. It does, you get a, a feel for it, but it helps to see sort of where the upvotes are as well. So uh, if you could interact with your peers in the community and uh, sort of float to the top the systems that you think are the most interesting for us to look at for the next pre-built reviews, that would be fantastic. Thank you for your help. There's a lot of them out there. Okay, with all that out of the way, first major news story is AMD and Valve working together to optimize Steam Deck for Linux. This should surprise nobody because AMD makes the SOC for the Steam Deck and uh, Valve is intending to install Linux on it. So the companies are working together. Valve has been pouring resources into its compatibility layer, which is called Proton. AMD has been on a hiring spree for Linux engineers this summer. If you are one, you might want to keep an eye out for that. And of course, both parties also have a vested interest in making the Steam Deck as successful as possible. One key area of focus seems to be improving the CPU frequency and power scaling while using Steam Play, or Proton. AMD and Valve's combined efforts could lead to improved CPU frequency driver code based on the ACPI CPVC, or Collaborative Processor Performance Control Specification, with AMD also beefing up development around its Linux scheduler, it's possible that AMD could be overhauling the Schedutil governor to better target CPU frequency scaling. As Pharonix notes, AMD will have a presence at this year's x.org developer conference, or XDC, so we can expect to learn more then. This one's really brief, but it's kind of fun. There's been a few renders or mock-ups flying around lately of brown or beige fans on an Asus board. The ones we've seen have been user renders. They're fun. They're, they're very well done. Uh, they are not real. <laughs> they're renders, but... The reason those are floating around lately is because of an ECC filing by ASUS for a new SKU that is called RTX 3070-8G, 8GB, dash Noctua. So uh, this was spotted by Kamachi and Saka on Twitter, and it, it is a real filing from what we can see. It'll be a matter of time to see if this actually makes it to market. These are filed in advance, but ultimately, I guess the idea is Noctua and ASUS working together on a card, so obviously it'll be Noctua's fans on an Asus card. It's not going to be magic. Noctua's fans are not magic. Many of them are pretty good. But uh, likely this is a collaborative effort because getting Noctua on a device will help sell the device, or at least Asus so thinks, because Asus is also capable of making decent fans for its own GPU coolers. But it could be kind of fun and different. Uh, Noctua is certainly is very highly regarded in fan manufacturing. And so it makes a lot of sense to partner with Noctua for a device that uses fans. We'll see how it comes out. It'd be a, that would be one, even in spite of the current interest level in board partner reviews, that'd be one I would really want to look at personally because I, I think it would just be interesting. So hopefully that comes out. AMD announcing a dual GPU card for five grand. You can get two of them for 10 grand. Actually, you get as many as you want. They're five grand each. That's how, that's how buying things generally works. But if you buy two, you can run basically quad GPU in two PCBs because that's how dual GPU cards also work. AMD took the wraps off of the uh, new workstation class GPUs. There's three of them that were built exclusively for Apple just recently. And this is for Apple's Mac Pro line of 
computers. The three new cards make up AMD's Radeon Pro W6000X series, and those consist of the W6900X, the Radeon Pro W6800X, and the Radeon Pro W6800X Duo. The new lineup will be a successor to AMD's current W5000X cards. AMD's Radeon Pro W6000X series will be based on RDNA 2.0, and will also include AMD's newer Infinity Cache and Infinity Fabric Link. As these cards are built for Apple in the Mac Pro line, they'll come in the form of Apple's MPX modules and are also built with Apple's Metal API in mind. The W6900X is built with 80 compute units, 5120 stream processors, a 256-bit memory bus, 128MB of Infinity Cache, 32 gigabytes of GDDR6, and a total graphics power of 300 watts. Meanwhile, the W6800X is built with 60 CUs, that's 3840 stream processors, a 256-bit bus, 128MB of cache, 32 gigabytes again of G6, and again 300 watts for the TGP. As for the Duo, this is a non-MCM, so not technically a multi-chip module approach. It is two pieces of silicon, but it's not an MCM approach in, in the traditional meaning. So it's a dual GPU, two monolithic dies, built with two W6800X GPUs. If you haven't been in the market for too long, you probably haven't seen one of these before. Those of you who've been around for at least four or five years have definitely encountered them. But uh, it's just two dies on a card. And historically, this has been functionally the same as running, say, Crossfire to some extent. There's a little, there's different overhead at play here. But that would traditionally be the equivalent. The reason we're pointing that out as the traditional equivalent, if you've not encountered these dual GPU boards before, is because it's not the same as, let's just take an imaginary GPU and say you've got one board with two GPUs on it, both of them have 20 CUs. It's not the same as having one die with 40 CUs on it because they're not in the same place. There are going to be physical limitations. Uh, there are going to be transactional differences when they're trying to get stuff out of memory. And uh, the memory, historically, would not act as a cohesive single pool. Anyway, these are linked through Infinity Fabric Interconnect. And so the cards, compute units, stream processors, Infinity Cache, and VRAM are, well, there's two sets of each of them here. And the card ends up with a TGP of 400 watts. Apple's Mac Pro supports up to two MPX modules, meaning users, again, could opt for a quad array via two W6800X Duo modules should they want to spend $10,000 for the privilege of so doing. Up next, Steam Hardware Survey and Software Survey. Another month has come and gone. That means more small updates to Steam's Hardware Survey. One thing we're starting to do now, though, is pay more attention to Linux adoption in the gaming community via the survey. The reason we're doing that is because of the Steam Deck. Not a big surprise. We are just trying to get ahead of it and see if there's an uptick when it releases that would help us uh, get an idea for how meaningful the, the launch was. So via Steam's hardware survey, Linux has now reached 1% share in the OS market. This is within the vacuum of Steam's collected data, so it doesn't represent the entire market, and certainly Linux's server market share is domineering overall. Steam's numbers show Linux up by 0.11 points over the last month, with both Ubuntu and Manjaro Linux. If you don't like my pronunciations, fight me. I, I know at least one of those is non-standard, but uh, we're going to move on, seeing a very slight 0.01 point uptick. Uh, and this is the highest share Linux has had in years just on the Steam hardware survey, mind you. And Valve, Steam Deck, and Proton are likely playing some part in the renewed interest. Just I, there's, I know there's going to be comments, and I'm thinking of Wendell from Level 1 Techs, who made a comment on our channel once when I was interviewing him, and he said that he knew there was going to be someone in the comments to correct him and say, The linker's been multi-threaded since V4. Where have you been? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. If Wendell has problems with Linux comments still, it's futile for me to try. So let's move on. Uh, also of note, this is another month where AMD's Radeon RX 6000 series cards have not appeared in the top GPUs via Steam's hardware surveys. They are absent at this point. And these most popular card on the charts remains the RX 580. Obviously, it's losing share over time. It's old. People are upgrading. But it's uh, now at 1.73%. So it has dropped 0.02 points in the last month. NVIDIA's GTX 1060 remains the most popular when Steam's users surveyed. It's at 9.17% share. And that has also dropped by 0.71 points month over month. Meanwhile, the fastest moving cards up the charts are the RTX 3060 at 0.13 increase and the 3060 laptop GPU at 0.15. 
Another trend we've been watching is the decline in share for quad-core CPUs, which lost another 0.25 points the last month, while octa-cores went up by half a point and elsewhere. 16 gigabytes is still preferred for system RAM at 45.53% share, though configurations beyond 16 gigabytes have grown notably in the last month. Thanks, Steve. Ow, my knee. Up next, NVIDIA and the ARM acquisition. Still in the news and still in consideration for getting blocked, at least in the UK. This is a $40 billion deal. It has to go through multiple regulatory hurdles. And the UK last April stepped in to intervene on the deal, citing security concerns. That has obviously developed in the time since. These were uh, on top of existing antitrust and monopoly concerns that were listed. So at the time, the UK's Competition and Markets Authority, or CMA, was ordered to build a report detailing the possible national security implications that an NVIDIA takeover would have. That was submitted July 20th, 2021. That's according to an updated merger inquiry. And while the details of the report haven't been disclosed, they don't appear to be in NVIDIA's favor based on reporting from Bloomberg. Bloomberg, for whatever it's worth, cites, quote, sources familiar with the matter and says that the implications are worrying. The UK is allegedly inclined to reject the deal. However, Bloomberg also stated that the UK government was likely to delve deeper into the merger and further review the findings of the report before coming to a final decision. Usually one would hope this is the way things work, where we, we read them and then we act on them, but uh, this is actually a, a newsworthy discovery in today's day and age. All right, NVIDIA continues at this point to remain confident, no surprise. And uh, at this point, the statement from NVIDIA to Bloomberg was, quote, we continue to work through the regulatory process with the UK government. We look forward to their questions and expect to resolve any issues they may have. So we'll see if anything happens there. Sony reports the $500 PlayStation 5 is now profitable. In its latest earnings report, Sony's CFO revealed the disc-based $500 model is no longer a lost leader, as has been commonly reported over the last decades now. Consoles and hardware have been historically used as loss leaders, not every generation, but many of them being sold at a loss for the sake of market share and growing the install base while collecting publisher fees for games sold and now, of course, service fees like online activation. However, the machines usually cross a threshold where they do become profitable. Some of this is volume, some of this is components getting cheaper over time, but for Sony, uh, Sony at this point has crossed that threshold with the $500 unit. It has stated that the digital version of the PS5 is not profitable yet. It is still selling it as a loss leader. And Sony notes that those losses continue to be offset by software sales and steady sales in uh, its online services. Sony also stated that the PS5 is now the fastest selling PlayStation in its history, having already sold more than 10 million units since it launched last November. Sony also stated that it remains committed to selling more than a 14.8 million PS5 consoles for its full fiscal year. That would match the amount of PS4 machines it sold in its first year of those. This one we're going to keep brief. It's not super interesting, but it's noteworthy. Uh, Intel accidentally teased Thunderbolt 5 with 80 gigabits per second of bandwidth and PAN3 modulation. As spotted by Anantex Ian Cutchers, some of the photos that Intel's EVP and GM for Client Computing Group, Gregory Bryant, tweeted, and that he's since deleted, are news for the Thunderbolt 5 specifications being listed. The photo can be seen over at Anantec, where a poster in the background shows ADG PHY technology. That in itself suggests that Intel's working on a physical layer capable of supporting 80 gigabit per second connections, which would be double the bandwidth of Thunderbolt 4. In the next story, late last year, Intel announced that it would be selling off its NAND flash business to SK Hynix for a total of $9 billion. The deal came with some caveats like Intel retaining its Optane technology and IP, as well as a staggered timeline for acquisition. Like we said at the time, the deal indicated that Intel wasn't necessarily exiting the storage business, because it's not, but it is exiting the NAND flash manufacturing business. The deal included Intel's NAND flash SSDs, flash and wafer business, as well as its NAND flash fab in China. At the time, SK Hynix didn't disclose its immediate plans for the acquisition, but now it's been revealed that it will spin Intel's NAND business into a separate company. The main thing here is that this would give SK Hynix better reach for the US market specifically. So that's strategically advantageous for SK Hynix, which is based in South Korea. And additionally, it would give the company a better foothold in the SSD market. And by the way, uh, SK Hynix was quick to point out that this deal has already been approved by the UK, the US, and the EU, 
and uh, it expects to get approval from China later this year. Asus is trying to get ahead of Windows 11 support. You may have seen all the TPM reports a while ago about it. It's not, not TPS reports from, from Office Space, but that's TPM 2.0 report, just to be clear on that, although I do need those TPS reports done. That would be great. Asus currently has a Windows 11 microsite where it lists compatible motherboards with TPM 2.0 support and respective BIOS updates for them, some of which are still under testing. This is to help users obviously better understand if their device supports Windows 11 officially at this time, since that was a bit of a cluster firmware originally when it was announced. Updating to the latest BIOS on some of these boards will enable TPM 2.0 support without users having to go through ASUS's UEFI BIOS utility. For now, ASUS boards with Intel 300, 400, 500 series chipsets and X299 are good to go. For AMD via ASUS, boards based on 300, 400, and 500 series chipsets are supported. The list also says that AMD's Threadripper boards will be supported soon, at least via ASUS for TRX40 and WRX80. Up next, Corsair in a video on its YouTube channel talking about DDR5 potentially requiring a bigger focus on cooling. This video was posted on the company's YouTube channel and it featured the marketing director, George Macris. Last time George was on our channel, uh, he told us that his official title at the company was God Emperor of Marketing. They weren't using titles at the time, so he had to quickly make one up because I asked and that's what I got. So I won't be asking again. Maybe he's been demoted. He's only the marketing director now. Uh, anyway, they discussed DDR5 memory, but George is very entertaining in the industry. He has some really fun videos when he appears in them and is very technical, especially on the marketing side. Actually worked on a lot of the old Corsair cases that we liked uh, a long time ago. So anyway, that's the history of what he does at Corsair. But, uh, this particular video is not overly technical. It does, however, give us a glimpse for what Corsair's engineering department is focused on for DDR5. In the video, Corsair's Matt and George discuss DDR5 in general. In a way, they sort of reveal that Corsair expects heat spreaders to play an increasingly important role with DDR5, especially as D5 DIMMs will make use of local power management by way of an on-die PMIC, which could theoretically lead to some heat waste being expended into the memory. They said, quote, DDR5 could conceivably run much hotter than D4. They've moved the voltage regulation off the motherboard itself. So now it's on the chip. You actually could be pumping a lot more heat into the DDR5 modules. The video goes on to discuss Corsair's dual heat path exchange or what it's calling DHX as a cooling solution and how it might relate to Corsair's DDR5 products. To be fair, this is likely a non-issue for DDR5 DIMMs running at the JEDEC specified 1.1 volts. However, some vendors are already talking about DIMMs of DDR5 12,600 with voltage ranges uh, up to 1.6 volts, although you can push it higher if you need to for overclocking. As for the timelines on this one, Intel's Alder Lake will be able to type first in the comments for DDR5 followed by Zen 4 from AMD shortly thereafter. It's looking like end of year might be when we first start seeing rollout and early 2022 would be when there's a wider switch over on both platforms for mainstream. And servers, of course, are in there as well. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching as always. You can subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly and use code SENDHELP to get a 10% discount on anything on the store. Uh, and again, that's, it's just, Sincerely, thank you for supporting the Gigabyte piece. We love doing that type of content piece. Patrick Stone and I worked on that one a lot. And, uh, and then Keegan worked on it a ton on the editing. Andrew worked on it on the filming. Uh, and Patrick Lathan helped with guidance for Patrick Stone on how we wanted to structure it. So full team effort. And thank you to those of you who have supported it, even if it's just by watching it. That helps a lot. So thank you. We'll see you all next time.